and relevant faculty research can strengthen the case for higher education's value. Of course, you know, higher education is constantly having to make a case for why it's important. People are always questioning why higher education has high tuition, questioning whether there's any value or applicability to things that people are learning in classrooms. I mean, there's a lot that goes on, a lot of questioning of the value of higher education, even though the evidence is very clear in terms of uh, income opportunities for graduates from colleges and universities versus those who didn't graduate from colleges and universities. There's still a need to really sort of make that case. And in localities, I think that those questions are, are really pointed sometimes, and particularly for state colleges and universities. So where is there faculty research that can be directly aligned with priority needs in localities, something like job forecasting? I mean, doing that kind of research that is directly applicable and relevant to challenges that are facing a particular locality, I think really do help make that case and help strengthen relationships between institutions of higher education and external partners. And how do you do things like deliberate economic inclusion, as I mentioned before? You know, as a way of reviving local economies. I mean, we all have a stake in strong local economies. So what role can anchor institutions play in making sure that local economies are stronger? And when people have employment, obviously there are lots of factors that, that are affected by employment and people's ability to, to purchase things, people's ability to live in the community, people's ability to do lots of other things. So what role can colleges and universities and other anchor institutions play in circulating more dollars for residents in local communities, I think is absolutely another important opportunity. And this sort of deepening, how do you deepen engagement and focus energy? And I don't think there's any necessarily one way to do this, and I think it's important in all this kind of work to really think about local contexts. I and mean, local contexts are always different. So there's no one model that works in one place that you can just plop down in another and say, you know, boom, instant partnership effectiveness. It's, it's not, it does, doesn't work that way. Um, but I do think that all anchor institution partnerships should really think about their strategy. Is their strategy going to focus on particular issues? Is it going to focus on a particular locality? And then how do you target the various distinct, discrete projects and initiatives that go on within an anchor institution? So how, do you, how do you target those practices and those programs in a way that actually focuses on a common agenda? And I just mentioned a particular example of that, which is something called the Port Richmond Partnership. It happens to be in Staten Island in New York. And there's a college by the name of Wagner College, which actually is not situated directly in a low income area. But they have made a decision to invest in the most challenged area in Staten Island and invest a substantial amount of resources in trying to improve that particular community. They made that as a decision because they see that as a part of their core mission as an institution that wants civic engagement to be a critical part of its core curriculum. So they see this as central to what they're doing. So in this particular community in Port Richmond, which is about 10 minutes from that campus, they have decided to focus substantial energy on a comprehensive initiative that addresses education, economic development, and health. And they're concentrating activity inside of their campus and activity between other anchor institutions across Staten Island. So they've created this partnership as a comprehensive effort that has gotten a lot of national attention as a, a model for a, a way in which an anchor institution can be strategic about how it aligns its resources in a way that addresses needs in a particular community. So you can go to the next one. And you know, educational pathways is another thing that I think about is one of the sort of obvious ways in which a college or university can connect with local schools. Uh, one of these ways in which uh, colleges and universities can make a contribution in their localities and, and potentially elsewhere, which is in strengthening education. And there's an initiative called the Civic Opportunity Initiative Network, which comes out of a foundation in New York called the New World Foundation, uh, which we have been advising over the years. 
And this effort is designed to strengthen pathways for young people, particularly those who are from challenged backgrounds, who are in public schools, who would not ordinarily go to a college or university. So it's sort of based on the whole idea that you can sort of provide economic capital to pay for the, the education of a number of young people who are coming out of high schools who probably wouldn't have graduated. So the program interfaces with juniors in high school and it, it brings them into a program that ultimately takes them all the way through to graduation in a college or university. But it has a civic component to it. So it's a college access program plus a civic engagement initiative. So as a part of being in this program, you certainly you get the tutoring and you get all the college preparation that you would get in any kind of college access program. But they add to it a civic engagement. The young people are in internships in community-based organizations, particularly community-based organizations from their own communities. So it actually strengthens their identity with their local community. And then they continue to be involved in internships and get leadership development training and get training in trying to influence policy and try to organize in communities and things of that sort all along as this program goes forward. Well, there is a cohort that they created, a pilot cohort, that is now in the junior year in college. And of course, the students who enter this program are all still in this program at this particular point in time, because it was based on the theory that if you provide the economic opportunity and the support systems around young people to go through college in this way, they will do it. But it was also based on the philosophy that civic engagement is a way of enhancing learning. And so that's just another feature, I think, of how there may be interesting opportunities for higher education in this kind of work. And understanding how the core mission of institutions of higher education can be served through something like civic engagement. And this program is expanding now. It is not trying to create other cohorts because it costs millions and millions to do this program. Uh, so they're trying to figure out a lower cost way to expand the program. So they've connected with different existing college access programs like the Rut Rutgers Future Scholars Program by adding the civic engagement dimension. So the Rutgers Future <coughs> Scholars Program engages 200 juniors in high school and takes them through a whole college access initiative. And if they perform at a certain level and they receive a certain GPA, they get their college education paid for wherever they want to go. And so they've been doing this for years, and now there are, I think, over 1,000 students who are part of this program. And then this Civic Opportunity Initiative Network now then added a new component to it by getting the students who are part of this program to be in internships, to be involved in community organizing, to be involved in lots of different other things. So the civic engagement aspect is now integrated into their work uh, as they move through colleges and universities. So there are lots of opportunities there as well. So we can go to the next one. Now, there is much, there's substantial awareness now, I think, compared to what it used to be. There's much more awareness in the field, sort of among people in the federal government, among people in the foundation community. There's a lot more awareness that anchor institutions can be assets to addressing challenges facing local communities. So that awareness is certainly there and it's certainly increased. And we really have to figure out how to effectively do this because this whole field has really evolved over the years. As I mentioned before, student service was really at the core of where the field was maybe 30 years ago, 35, 40 years ago. The conversation was really about how do you get students out there volunteering in the community. And still, that's a core aspect of how colleges and universities engage in their surrounding communities. But a lot of that conversation has evolved now to something far more comprehensive and really focused on universities that are fully engaged in their surrounding communities and pulling upon all of their resources to address certain issues. So there's greater awareness of that. So we'll go to the next one. And, uh, and certainly, on a federal policy front, there's been a lot of conversation. So much of this work that goes on in the national field was influenced by a program called COPSI, which was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, 
and, and uh, shut down maybe several years ago, a few years ago. But it was around and had its heyday in around the 90s. There was a period of time when there are numerous grants that were being made from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to different colleges and universities to engage in their local communities, usually around some kind of research that would improve an issue that was facing a local community. So even though the program no longer exists, there are numerous different colleges and universities that have received grants from that particular program who are now very involved in this kind of national field advocating for why it's important for the federal government to think about anchor institutions in their strategies. And there are a number of more recent federal initiatives that have been trying to integrate institutions of higher in education into their work, such as the Promise Neighborhoods Program, as well as the Strong City, Strong Communities, which is actually here in Cleveland, as I understand. And this whole idea is really relevant to all types of federal agencies. So whether you're in the Department of Education, you're in the Department of <coughs> Commerce, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, whatever issue you're trying to address, they're manifested in localities, for one. And two, you have to leverage resources in localities to actually tackle those issues. They could be health needs, whatever. Whichever issue you're facing, you have to tap local resources if you're going to address them effectively. And so some of these federal agencies have really caught on to this, and, but many more haven't. And so that's a part of the work that needs to be done. So you can go to the next one. And so, as was mentioned, this Anchor Institutions Task Force. And this is a network. It's a network as well as a think tank. And the purpose of the Anchor Institutions Task Force is to promote the role of anchor institutions in their surrounding communities. So we're really holding this notion very high in our work. And we're saying that if you are going to strengthen and transform communities, you in some way, shape, or form need to leverage anchor institutions. So we see a policy component to this, as was mentioned before, uh, that there are numerous federal agencies that really could have a stake in this, numerous local governments that could really have a stake in this. And we want to try to get as many different government agencies thinking about their anchor institution strategy as possible. There's a lot of knowledge that comes out of the work that's been going on in anchor institutions around the country. We want to mine that knowledge. We want to highlight promising practices. We want to do writing. And so we did a literature review on all the writing that's been done recently on anchor institutions, which is going to be coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, we commissioned a journal where we got different people who are members of the Anchor Institutions Task Force to write from their experiences as leaders of anchor institutions. What's been working, what are the challenges, things of that sort. We want to enhance the capacity of how anchor institutions engage in their surrounding communities through this kind of knowledge. So that is absolutely critical to what we want to do. So we want to influence policy. We want to strengthen the knowledge base of, of what it means for an anchor institution to be involved in its community. And we want to build the capacity of anchor institutions to engage in their local communities. We have over 200 members in this anchor institutions task force. The members are individuals who represent anchor institutions and other partners. They believe in the values and the purpose of the task force. And so in lots of ways, we're creating a policy voice that can really advocate on behalf of this particular kind of work. We're not a lobbying organization in any way, shape, or form. We really want to be a resource. We want to be a knowledge resource to many people who are out there about what's possible as far as these partnerships are concerned. And so for us structurally at MARGA Incorporated, this is something that we actually coordinate. And we coordinate it in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania. And policy really was sort of the driver for how the task force got created, because as the new administration was coming in in 2009, uh, there was a desire to sort of inform the Department of Housing and Urban Development about different key trends. So Ira Harkavy at the University of Pennsylvania was asked to bring together a group of people in the field who have really been working on anchor institution engagement. And we all came together and wrote a chapter in a book that's called Retooling HUD. And in this book, Retooling HUD, 
uh, it was submitted to HUD as a way to just inform them about what's going on in the field and give them ideas about ways that they can innovate. So we ultimately decided, okay, so we've created this group to write a report. What are we going to do about it? And so we said, well, wouldn't it be great if we could actually have an ongoing association that would continue to promote this idea and would continue to engage government and other partners? And that's ultimately how the Anchor Institutions Task Force came into being. So you can go to the next. And we have over 200 members now, and we're creating subgroups within the task force with specific interest areas. And we're really framed in a way that encompasses the, the various types of anchor institutions. As I mentioned at the beginning, the definition of anchor institutions is constantly evolving. There are various types of anchor institutions. And we want to be a, a task force that is actually relevant to all those different types. And right now, we're heavily represented by higher education. 